the peasants in China, the Muslims in Algeria, all the people in Cuba. But in the United States, our Negro population is in the minority. And even if the communists should be successful in creating similar liberation movements among other segments of our people, as they're trying to do, for instance, among Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and even American Indians, even if they should succeed and then amalgamate all of these together into one large liberation movement, it still adds up to a minority of the total population. And the communists are not stupid. They realize that revolution of force and violence dependent upon a minority is doomed to ultimate failure, except in those areas where they actually do constitute a majority. But they aren't going to settle for just part of the United States. They want all of it. And so they made it clear long ago that their violent war of national liberation must be secondary to the nonviolent proletarian revolution. To take the United States, all of the United States, it'll be necessary, they say, to involve white people as well as black to create a broad coalition, a revolutionary link between the civil rights movement, organized labor, peace groups, student dissidents, and in general, to escalate their revolution in America from race war to class war. Now this, in a nutshell, is the communist position on the Negro question. Let's turn now to the record and see how the communists themselves explain it. Now, this communist booklet entitled American Negro Problems was published in 1928. It was written by John Pepper, alias Joseph Pogani. Now, Pogani was sent to this country as the personal envoy of Joseph Stalin, and his specific mission was to bring the American Communist Party into line with the policies and directives from Moscow, particularly with regard to the Negro question. And here is what Pogani said. The Communist Party of America, in its fight against imperialism, must recognize clearly the tremendous revolutionary possibilities of the liberation movement of the Negro people. It is the basic duty of the Communist Party to develop all revolutionary possibilities of the Negro race. The Black Belt in the South constitutes virtually a colony within the body of the United States of America. Self-determination means the right to establish their own state, to erect their own government if they choose to do so. The Communist Party of America must come out openly and unreservedly for the right of national self-determination for the Negroes. But it would be a major mistake to believe that there can be any other revolution in imperialist America than a proletarian revolution. Now let me repeat that last sentence because it's the key to this entire presentation. It would be a major mistake to believe that there can be any other revolution in imperialist America than a proletarian revolution. Well, moving forward to the year 1935, we come to this communist booklet entitled The Negroes in a Soviet America, written by James Ford and James Allen. Beginning on page 24, the general strategy is laid out in rather graphic form. You see, there's a major heading here entitled the Negro and Revolution. Directly beneath this, there's a subheading entitled Two Revolutions in One. And then within this section, it says, the problem of Negro liberation has two aspects. We shall first consider each separately and then show how the solution for the first flows into the solution for the second. Now, the next subheading then is entitled The Rebellion of an Oppressed Nation. And the section that follows that describes the violent revolution that must be fought to liberate the black belt of the South. And then finally, over in the next page, there's another subheading entitled The Proletarian Revolution. And here we begin to get an idea, finally, of what this phase of the revolution is all about. It says, capitalism is decaying. It is an outworn system. Capitalism is based upon the private ownership of machines, factories, railroads, land, and all other means of production. Only one thing can do away with the basis for the existence of capitalism, the expropriation of the capitalists. And by the way, I'm sure you realize that everyone here, by communist definition at least, is a capitalist. So you should feel good to know that there are those who are planning your expropriation someday. In order to expropriate the capitalists, the workers first need to discard the existing government machinery and to institute a working class government. 
under this new workers' government, the building of socialism begins. Now, exactly what that's all about, the building of socialism, we'll get to in a moment. But finally, on page 28, under the third subheading entitled The Combination of Two Revolutions, the communists reveal how the two phases of their revolution are related to each other and which of the two is most important to them. Between the proletarian revolution and the revolution of the Negro people, there is a living link. This is the working class. Here reposes the leadership of the two aspects of the revolution. But the Negro communist is first and foremost the exponent of the proletarian revolution. Well, 1935 is a long time ago. And sometimes we hear it said that the communists have since abandoned this concept. But ladies and gentlemen, they cannot abandon it for the simple reason that if they did so, they'd be abandoning the classic dual form of revolution dictated by Marxism-Leninism. They'd cease to be communists. To justify violence, they have to be able to claim that they're liberating people. And if people are to be liberated, then it's necessary to go through the motions, at least, of pretending that they have a right to form a nation of their own. And so the communist position on the Negro question today is no different than it was back in 1928. Now, Political Affairs is the official monthly magazine of the Communist Party in this country. The date on this particular issue is November 1968. The feature article for that month was The Right of Black America to Create a Nation, written by communist theoretician Claude Lightfoot. Now, Lightfoot points out that many years of migration of Negroes into the North and of Caucasians into the South have altered the population statistics to the point where the black belt is considerably smaller today than it was when the communist position on the Negro question was first drafted. Therefore, he says, the concept of a Negro nation must not necessarily be restricted to just one large territory in the South, but must be expanded now to include the so-called ghetto areas in the North. So having updated the basic strategy to reflect present realities, he then repeats the same old communist line. On page 9, he says, We should call for a plebiscite of all black Americans on whether they want to remain in the general commonwealth or to establish another nation within the continental United States. Thus the slogan of self-determination today means the struggle for the right of black America to form a nation if it elects to do so. Now in passing, ladies and gentlemen, you may have wondered why the Communist Party has been a staunch supporter of the drive to place a black studies curriculum into our high schools and colleges. Well, the reason becomes obvious the minute you take a look at the textbooks and the study guides. The net effect of these courses on the students who enroll is to create a consciousness of nation. By stressing the historical and cultural differences between our black and white citizens instead of the similarities, the predictable impact upon the student is such that he'll view the communist call for a separate nation with far more acceptance than his parents did. Under the guise of academic balance, these courses have become a brilliant device for conditioning young people to accept still one more part of the total program for revolution. But returning uh, once again to Claude Lightfoot, after having called for a separate nation, he then repeats the ever important point that as important as the national liberation movement may be, it still must be secondary in importance to the nonviolent, peaceful transition to communism called the Socialist Revolution. He says, From this it follows that the advocates of a black nation must identify themselves with all that is required to set up a socialist America, recognizing that black people alone could never destroy capitalism. To digress again for just a moment, I'd like to point out that this concept of two kinds of revolution is really the basis for that much publicized split between Moscow and Peking. The Moscow group says, there are two kinds of revolution, violent and nonviolent. We believe in using either or both, depending on which combination proves to be the most effective. But as true Marxist-Leninists, we believe that the gradual, nonviolent approach is more effective in today's modern world. To which the Peking group shouts in reply, heresy, heresy, 
true there are two kinds of revolution and we 